Welcome to old friends and welcome to new friends. Friends, old friends are people whom I've known in my life's journey. New friends are people that I haven't yet met, but I will claim them as new friends as soon as I meet them. There is a crew of people that are helping me and since I was raised as a proletariat, I'm very sensitive to the people who are behind the scenes, and I want to introduce them to you. First is Christina Burroughs, who will soon be Christina Campbell, as she's just gotten engaged. She is my neighbor and a angel of mercy. <laughs> My technician is Phil Shapiro, a gentleman whom I've known for several years. He is a whiz at technology, and right now he's holding a lamp and looks suspiciously like the Statue of Liberty. The last participant in this YouTube is my cat Spike. He will make an appearance whenever he's good and ready. Spike thinks that we are gathered together for a play date on his, for his benefit. And uh, he's right on cue. Hello, Spike. <coughs> Spike is a neuter male. He's a lover, not a fighter. And he's basically androgynous, like his big brother. Um, I'm comfortably heterosexual, but I also like to think of myself as a creative amalgam of both animus and anima. <clears throat> I will introduce the reason for making this YouTube demonstration now. I've been writing a book for more than 30 years. And the book is finally out, and it's an ebook on Kindle. It is in the process of morphing into a print on demand paperback book, and that step will be forthcoming very quickly. So, my major task is to introduce you to my book and this is called marketing or in the current idiom I'm attempting to create a brand <laughs> which is very very funny Be am I selling out no I'm not and I'll explain the reason that I don't feel that I'm selling out <clears throat> my book is called training wheels for beginning psychotherapists slash a personal memoir. It combines two important strands. First of all, my profession, and the word profession is extremely important, it combines my profession as a clinical psychologist with my life's journey. The two are synchronous and cannot be torn apart without doing violence to my life experience. Now, there are a few examples of professional authors who have told the story of their lives in terms of their training manuals. <clears throat> I, I hope this doesn't sound immodest, but the first person to do this sort of technique of synthesizing both halves was Sigmund Freud. Freud in 1900 published The Interpretation of Dreams where he proceeded to analyze several extremely complex dreams and without giving the source of them. In 1927 Freud revealed that the dreams were his which gave people a field day in terms of their psychoanalytic interpretation of the symbolic meaning of the dreams, 
which hasn't abated to this day. <clears throat> so that's the format of my book. I started writing it when I was clinical director of a large mental health organization in Prince George's County. I was stationed at Andrews Air Force Base. I was in the Air Force for 20 years and 17 days. The reason I had to stay in 17 days extra was because if in those days when you entered in the middle of the month, you had to stay to the end of the month. So they tacked 17 days onto my retirement, which was highly stressful. <clears throat> I was in the officer's quarters <clears throat> at uh, Bowling Air Force Base, ready to retire. And on the day that I retired, I took my razor and I chucked it out the window because that part of my life was over and I haven't shaved since. Just like Samson. <laughs> and my strength comes from my beard, among other things. So I would sit in my office at Andrews Air Force Base Hospital, I was the chief psychologist, and look across the street at this empty lot. And I said to myself, one day I'm going to be sitting in an office building on that empty lot, looking across at my window where I used to have my office. And that's exactly what happened. So while I was the clinical director of a large mental health clinic, in 1980s dollars, we grossed over a million dollars a year. <clears throat> and we were in four different locations. <clears throat> while I was sitting in my office, I'd look across the window where I used to sit when I was in the Air Force and uh, smugly think how clever I was. <clears throat> and it lasted until damaged care came in the window and uh, things changed dramatically for the worse. <clears throat> now, as clinical director, I was called upon to write a monthly column for our newsletter. And I enjoyed that very, very much. And I found out that people turned to my column the first thing in the newspaper and praised me very highly for the topics that I was talking about. So this led inevitably to my writing chapters on various topics, some having to do with my own journey some having to do with the technical aspects of my profession. For the next more than 20 years, I wrote chapters. And now my book contains 160 chapters. It is over a thousand pages in length. And it's my story. <laughs> Now, the next question, which can reasonably be asked, is do I have a diagnosis? The answer is yes. And in order to tell you my diagnosis, I want to let you know that I'm a firm advocate in self-disclosure. Since I don't do guilt and shame, I'm only accountable to my own morality. Self-disclosure is straightforward to me. And in my theoretical framework, self-disclosure begets self-disclosure. It is the social lubricant that draws people together. And I believe implicitly that if I'm willing to be candid and honest and open, the people around me will reciprocate and that's called trust and hearing the other person which are characteristics of good therapy an additional component that's very important to mention in this context is that i'm russian my father was from the ukraine 
and my mother was from a country called Bessarabia, which no longer exists. Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Romania all had their brief periods of time in the sun. The f net effect of my Russian patrimony is that I believe we learn more from pain than from happiness. Now that sounds preposterous. I'll just cite one example. A couple of examples. In my estimation, all therapy is bereavement therapy. It's pain for the losses that we've experienced over our lifetime's journey. And the pain of the losses has a characteristic track. Two characteristics of this track are one, when we experience a loss, we re-experience all of the losses that we've suffered. They're cumulative. And it's not summation, it's algorithmic. Above the classical proscenium arch of the Greek theater are two masks, the mask of comedy and the mask of tragedy. And they're both valid and they both counterbalance each other. <clears throat> One of the pivotal, here comes the self-disclosure. <laughs> One of the pivotal events in my life when I almost drowned in Acapulco Bay. A near-death experience changes you permanently. And there's no going back from the lessons that you learned in terms of the nature of your life permanently. The near-death experience catapulted me, that's not too strong a word, <laughs> catapulted me from the end of my late adolescence into adulthood. Precipitously, I was a different person than when I almost lost my life, when I came out of the water. Talk about the symbolism of a rebirth in the sea. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute. Now, I've said to some of my clients, in terms of the importance of this near-death experience, perhaps they could volunteer to have a near-death experience. But I dismiss the idea as impractical and having lots of uh, ethical issues associated with it. But I had the thought. <laughs> So we can call this the uh, Near-Death Academy <laughs> and give diplomas when you graduate. But it's an impractical idea, although <clears throat> thoughtfully, it's a major player. So I started writing, and in terms of my diagnosis, <clears throat> let me, what does this have to do with my book? Everything. <laughs> my book is using myself as a subject and psyching myself out, given my professional training. It's important in terms of the sequence of events to know that I was a people before I was a psychologist. It's that in that order. My profession gave me a vocabulary. It gave me a way to synthesize my experience. But I was me from the start. Now I want to pay homage to a cherished mentor of mine. His name is Mr. Ganley, and I'm embarrassed to tell you I don't remember his first name. He occupied two significant roles 
in my development. I was in the eighth grade, and he was my eighth grade baseball coach. So I revered him for that. I was a legendary athlete. He also taught a course <laughs> called, quaintly in those days, mental hygiene. <laughs> so for the assignment in mental hygiene, we had to go home and write a paper indicating what we wanted to do with our lives. So I revered Mr. Ganley, so I went home and I scribbled some words down on a piece of paper. I wish I had it today. And I brought it back to Mr. Ganley the next day. He looked at it, read it very carefully, and he raised up his head and he said to me, Oh, I see. You want to be a psychologist. No one had ever told me that before. And I didn't even know how to spell the word. I looked it up in the dictionary under S that night. I don't know what Mr. Ganley saw in me, but it was there. And I've never wavered in my pursuit of the profession of clinical psychology. But one story that illustrates the fact that I was a person before I was a psychologist. I was in military school. Military school was the optimal time of my entire life because things were predictable, unlike the chaos of my family of origin. In my family of origin, a crisis happened. It was never resolved, but it was simply superseded by the next crisis. There was no predictability in my external world, whatever. How many kids attend 26 different schools that I remember before I got to high school? I was always the new kid in school. And at the first recess at the new school, the meanest, nastiest bully in the schoolyard came looking for me in order to determine where I was in the hierarchy. And the first two times, I got beat up bad. The third time, I had a rolled up roll of pennies in my fist. And when the bully came up to me and swung at me, I ducked and I hit him in the cheekbone with the hand that had the roll of pennies. And I knocked him out on his feet. And he was stunned. And he came to and he said, man, you crazy. And nobody bothered me ever again. Never. But so. <laughs> Let me tell you the other side of that story. <laughs> in military school, the end of the term comes. I was in middle school, seventh, eighth grade, and they gave an award, awards for the scholarship of the students. And Mark Plotkin and I were very good students. I didn't pay attention to my grades. I memorized the assignments without uh, any trouble at all. And I got a 93, and I won the gold medal. And Mark Plotkin got a 91 and won the silver medal. And Mark and I were friends, at least I thought we were. Mark was a day student at the Miller Academy, and there was a hierarchy, and I was a dormitory student, and that was a higher category than the day students. And his parents owned a grocery store in Stanford, Connecticut, and he was the first person in his family to have the advantage of this higher education. So he came back with a silver medal, and his parents chewed him out 
for not winning the gold medal. And the next year, he came back and it was so competitive and nasty that I was hurt because I'd lost a friend. Well, the grades came out at the end of the term and Mark got a 93 and I got a 95. And I could look at his face and see how crestfallen he was and how he was going to have to take the news home to his parents. So I said to him after the class, I said, Mark, I've got two of these gold medals and you can't wear two of them, so the best I can wear is a gold medal with a tiny pin indicating that I've worn it before, and I'm tired of that. Could I trade one of my gold medals for your silver medal? And Mark looked at me, and he said, would you do that, John? Of course. And we swapped. I didn't need many, many, many years of professional training to do that. It was in me from the start. And uh, so the profession of psychology gave me the language and the structure and the theory to access parts of myself that were there from the beginning. So my diagnosis. <laughs> I am what is called, and the language is very important, I have a stable attachment condition, not a disorder, which is pathological. <laughs> stable attachment condition. When I was born, I had three neurotic women compete 24-7 to meet every single need of mine before I knew I needed it. My mother, my aunt, and my grandmother. I was the first male child born in the family, and they took care of me, <laughs> big time. <laughs> my mother, who came through Ellis Island, said her two sons, my brother and my younger brother and myself, were her two eyes to the new world. And she meant that literally. In her lifetime, my mother went from seeing horse-drawn streetcars in the street to people landing on the moon. And her two sons were her two eyes to the new world. But at the age of two, two very, very important things happened, which changed the course of my life. I decided that I was going to learn to speak the word self. So when I, my mother hovered over one of her eyes, <laughs> I said self, and I did it myself. She never got over that. My mother figured that we would, were an embedded ego mess, that if she sneezed, I would catch a cold. And here I was, an independent human being with a mind of my own. She never got over it. And when I joined the Air Force ROTC and I was called to active duty, as the airplane banked above New York City on my way to my first duty assignment, I knew that I had blinded my mother in one eye. I knew that for a fact. And when I helped my brother, my two-year younger brother, leave the house, my mother killed herself at the age of 52 because she was now blind. And I live with that. <clears throat> and I've had a lot of therapy around it. And now <clears throat> my mother was cremated. She ended up in Pasadena, California. 
and her ashes, this is California style, were packed into a tube, metal tube, on the underwing of an airplane with 24 other tubes, and the airplane flew into the setting sun on the Pacific Ocean. The pilot flipped the switch and all the ashes descended to the sea, mixed together in the cards. I love it, I love it. So when I sit on the shore of the Pacific Ocean and I see the sand and the sea and the sky, my mother is all around me and it gives me enormous peace. So, <laughs> mentors. <laughs> so, I have a stable attachment condition. <clears throat> that means my needs were met. <laughs> Ideally, my glass has always been half full because my needs were instantly met. I was never frustrated. So I have a positive outlook on life. And where does the attachment condition come? My father and I were very, very, very close. I was his first male child. He took me around the neighborhood. In those days, things were very primitive. Demonstrating my external genitalia to the world at large to prove <laughs> dramatically that I was a male child. <laughs> and I attach myself to my father. My favorite memory of having my father as my father, we're in a car, it's late at night, it's a DeSoto, and I'm sitting in the back with my brother, my father and my mother are in the front seat, and the car headlights flash across the roof of the car. Swish, swish, swish. And I'm wrapped in my father's leather jacket. And I could smell his sweat and his cigarette smoke and his cologne. And I'm the safest in the world because I have my father's jacket around me. Well, fast forward. When I was 10 years old, my father was arrested in Mexico City. I grew up in Mexico City and was taken off to the maximum security jail in Mexico. It was the equivalent of Dever Devil's Island because he was a political prisoner. And we're at the main railway station in Mexico City. And there are two plainclothes cops with pistols stuck in the waistband of their pants. And I know something terrible is happening. I don't know what. So I go to my bags and I reach in and I take out a toy cap pistol and I draw it on the Plain clothesmen, and they go for their guns, and they realize they're being threatened by a ten-year-old kid with a toy pistol. And my father turns to me, and he says, "You're now the man of the house. You're responsible for the safety of your mother and your brother." And I was ten years old. I didn't see my father for 11 years. And then when I got my master's degree, my mother said to me, <laughs> the worst thing she could say to me for those ensuing 11 years was, you're just like your father. <laughs> I beamed when she said that, she never got it. So she says, what do you want for a graduation present? You've graduated with high honors. I assumed that she th thought I would ask for the equivalent of a Walkman. 
I said to her, find my father for me. And she was taken aback. She said, if you go down to Mexico City and go into the Musicians' Union, my father was a concert classical violinist, and ask any musician, they'll tell you where to find your father. So I was, the next day I was uh, on an airplane to Mexico City. And my mother predicted that my father would debauch me and make a wastrel of me. And that's just what he did. <laughs> we would meet for lunch at a somewhat run-down restaurant, and I would order fresh-squeezed orange juice and camarones naturales, fresh shrimp that were caught that morning. And after we had the breakfast, we would go down to the nearest pool hall and we'd hustle each other like crazy and talk trash to one another. And then we'd go to the highlight and he'd teach me how to bet on the quinella and all the intricacies. So he debauched me and I became a wastrel and I connected with my father and I was close to him, very close to him until he died. When you were in my father's physical presence, you were caught up in energy, his energy. But when you left his presence, as if he clicked you off on a TV screen, you ceased to exist. <laughs> it's time for the Catalympics. <laughs> Spike is a nocturnal animal, so he exercises during at night. <clears throat> Mentors have been an extremely important part of my life. And I know exactly what they see in me to have them reach out. They see the lost little boy whose father was taken from him. And that's what they relate to. It must be clear to them. <clears throat> the official start of psychology, all graduate students have this year tattooed on the inside of their wrist started in 1874 by Wilhelm Wundt in Leipzig, Germany. That's the start of the field of psychology. Wilhelm Wundt trained Titchener, who went to Cornell and started the first psychology lab in this country. Dahlenbach, Carl Dahlenbach, was a student of Titchener's, and I was a student of Carl Dahlenbach. Four generations. That's the whole history of psychology, but I'll get into that in a minute. <laughs> that's not the whole history of psychology by any stretch of the imagination, but that's what the history textbooks say. At the University of Texas, Carl Dahlenbach was a professor emeritus. He was in his 80s, and he was blind as a bat. His glasses were as thick as Coke bottles. So he'd get into his Packard, a green Packard, <laughs> say goodbye to his wife, and drive the mile to his parking space at the school. All the graduate students in the area rushed into the street, stopped traffic in all four directions, while Dahlenbach would wheeze his old Packard to his special parking spot, saying, my traffic is light these days, <laughs> not realizing that his graduate students were spread out along his route. <laughs> so Carl Dahlenbach was my advisor. 
and I needed his permission to sign off on my proposed course work. <clears throat> what Carl Dahlenbach and I shouted each other about was the special varnish that Stradivarius, Amati, and of the school of Venetian violin makers used in the 1400s. That's what we would argue about. And I'd say, Dr. Dahlenbach, you need to sign my proposed coursework. He said, I'll sign it. Don't bother me. I'm now I'm the special varnish. <laughs> so we're talking, and Carl Dahlenbach says, that was the study by Smith and Jones done in 1916. And I say, no, Dr. Dahlenbach, that was done in 1918. So he raises his voice and he says, no, that was 1916. And I say, no, that was 1918. Margaret McGrade, who is the editor of the American Journal of Psychology, is down the road, down the street down the office. She comes rushing through the hall and she says, what's the matter with you guys? Smith and Jones wrote two articles, one in 16 and one in 18. Now quit your squabbling. <laughs> in terms of my mentors, Sir Isaac Newton said that I can see so far because I stand on the shoulders of giants. He meant Isaac Barrow, who was his mentor at um, Cambridge. So I stand on the shoulders of giants. And a student came up to me at the end of a term, and she said, you're the fourth generation, and you've stood on the shoulders of giants. And I'll be standing on your shoulders, and I'm the fifth generation. And she was right. <clears throat> so I'm a stable attachment condition. <laughs> there are several more disturbed kinds of attachment disorders, but my glass is always half full. And I give this credit for this to my father. To me, life is absurd. That's an existential position. And I laugh like hell at the quirks and paradoxes of life. I just laugh never at anyone but at the complexities of life itself. And that's probably my major strength as a human being, to be able to laugh. And I'm body, both body, B-A-U-D-Y, and body, <laughs> B-A-D-Y, in terms of board, and I enjoy that sort of humor. It's never at anyone's expense. I could never laugh at a person. But laugh with a person at life's absurdities? That's what counts. <clears throat> so I've got my diagnosis in the book <laughs> and my journey. <clears throat> and. The philosopher Schopenhauer, who was a contemporary of Sigmund Freud, says, the first 25 years of your life, you're creating, you have a cushion, and you're creating a tapestry design on the surface of the cushion. And the, you have the colors, and you're sewing them in. 
when you're 25 years old, you suddenly flip over the cover that you've been sewing the design upon and you see how the knots interweave on the other side of the cushion. And it's a whole other pattern of interconnections of the various threads. That's the second 25 years of your life. The third 25 years, <laughs> you can look at the cushion and simultaneously be aware of both the design and the other side. Simultaneously. It's holistic. It's all the same pattern from different points of view. There's a saying of the Buddha that goes as follows. The first third of your life, you're just becoming. And the second third of your life, you're being. And in the third third of your life, you give it all back. And it's an honor to be able to give it all back to the people who follow after me. There's an old African saying that when an old person dies, a library burns down. I refuse to accept that. I want to leave behind me a legacy that showed I passed through. <laughs> In my moments of grandiosity, which some people feel are contiguous, I think of myself as a bard. In the Homeric tradition, blind Homer is led down to the shores of the Aegean Sea. It's nighttime and there's a bonfire. He strings his lyre, he opens his mouth, and out come the words, Sing, goddess, of the anger of Achilles. And that's the opening line to the Iliad. And it wasn't written down. It was memorized and preserved till it was written down <laughs> in the ninth century. <laughs> Who knows how many transformations it had gone through by that time. <laughs> so I see myself as a bard, and my challenge is to tell stories, to challenge people's way of thinking, to ask them to look at the path of their lives. Aristotle said it so beautifully. Aristotle said there are three components to a good life. And the order is extremely important. <laughs> the first one is ethos, and that's morality. It's very private, it's very special, it's very unique to the person, but it's moral values. The second component is pathos, and that's emotions, connections. And the third and last in the line is logos, that's rationality and abstract thinking. And in terms of the accountability of ethos, I'm the only one who has the roadmap of conscience. My conscience is not punitive. My conscience is my friend. It guides me. There are times when I choose to ignore it <laughs> with horrific consequences. <laughs> but it's my gentle 
guiding friend. And it lives inside my body. It's a living entity. And I've been able to perceive that part of me. I call it the Great Spirit. And it lives inside of me. It's not a punitive superego. It's a, a friend on the road. And it lives inside of me. Now, I, since I'm a sorry storyteller, I fancy myself a bard. Uh, my discourse sometimes can be repetitive. I beg my students that when they hear me threatening to say a story that they've already heard, to raise their hands and say, ditto, and I'll pick up the cue and I'll realize that I've said the story before and I'll move on. But students never do that. And when I ask them, when I recognize that I've repeated the story, I say to them, why didn't you call out ditto? And their answer is always the same, bless their hearts. They say, we enjoy hearing you say the stories and even though we've heard it before, we're not going to interrupt you because it sounds differently every time you tell it. <laughs> so, uh, at the risk of repeating myself, which is all right, because it'll come out differently anyway, I just want to alert you of that possibility. <clears throat> what does it mean for me to be a psychologist? That question echoes in my head repetitively. I can only give you indirect answers to that question. For example, I sing on my way to the office. What do I sing? zippity doo -dah. What else could I sing? <laughs> because I'm so excited. And I typically, when I was a clinical director of a large outpatient clinic, I would see clients from 10 in the morning till 2 o'clock, take a break, and then see clients from 4 o'clock to when I close down at 10. A student asked me, wasn't I tired at the end of a day? And the answer is no. I was exalted and I'd drive home at 10 o'clock after returning all my phone calls. And one winter's night, I was driving home about 10 o'clock and on the radio was Mozart's adaptation of Handel's Messiah. I had heard of the existence of the piece, but I had never heard it before. Mozart massaged Handel's Messiah in his, uh, with his own particular magic. So I'm listening to this on the radio, and I'm jumping up and down with the beat. <laughs> Smokey the Bear is on my tail with red lights. Very proper policeman comes over, and he says, get out of your car. And he proceeds to test me for alcoholism. He has me touch my nose with my eyes closed. He has me walk in a straight line. And this is nothing impaired about me. So he says to me, you were driving erratically, and I thought you might be intoxicated. And I said, no, officer, thank you for stopping me. I'm not intoxicated. And then I said what I never should have said before. <laughs> I said to the policeman, I guess I'm drunk on Mozart. And he just looks at me. He thought Mozart was like Thunderbird. <laughs> some cheap red wine. <laughs> and finally he got it. He said, get out with you. <laughs> so I sing 
and I'm exalted at the end of my day. I don't always sing zippity doo da. There's another song that I sing. It's an old gospel song. It goes as follows. You've got to walk the lonesome valley. You've got to walk it by yourself. There's no one else can walk it for you. You've got to walk it your, by yourself. I call that the existential national anthem. And I've threatened to get t-shirts and teach a secret handshake to all of my friends, knowing that they'll appreciate it like I do. So you've got to walk the Lonesome Valley. And that's my Russian patrimony speaking. Now, what's in my book? <laughs> I'm going to read a short chapter that's very illustrative of the 160 chapters that are in my book. <clears throat> The chapter, and I hope this is self-evident, deals with nostalgia. Nostalgia is one of the most complicated words, to my way of thinking, in the English language. Here's how it breaks down in terms of Indo-European heritage. Nos, N-O-S, is an ancient word meaning village. Algia means pain, so nostalgia means homesickness. So these chapters in my book are tipped in nostalgia. Is there any veracity to my mem memories? I could only answer that question yes and no. <clears throat> They've been painted over by the curative powers of the passage of time. Are they real? That question is preposterous. They're real to us. They might be to no one else. But that doesn't matter. They're real to us. <clears throat> so many of these chapters are in the form of nostalgic memoirs. Now, what is a memoir? It has three criteria. The memoir has to be true about you, <laughs> with that patina of time and distortion. <clears throat> So it has to be about you, that's one. It has to be true, in question mark, in quotes. And the memoir has in it the change of who you are from the beginning of the memoir to the end of the memoir. That's called the narrative arc. And it's a very clear progression as I've learned in all of my advanced writing courses, that you have to be a different person at the end, and the journey is marked by the change in you. <clears throat> so, let me give you an example of a memoir steeped in the patina of time. As the reader may know from my writings, I spent all of my summers while in college as a counselor in summer camps for teenagers from New York City whose parents wanted their time free for travel. It was a wonderful experience for me, a veritable training lab for the things in my life, such as mentoring and developing interpersonal skills with young people. At a camp dance, with a fiercely chaperoned dividing line between girls and boys, my eye happened to fall upon a tall, thin woman named Elizabeth. What I particularly appreciated 
about her person was the straight way she stood with never a rolled shoulder to her height. The direct glance in her eyes and the hint of a small smile tinged with touches of amusement and braces on her teeth, if my memory serves me accurately. <laughs> Our glances may have crossed or not, at least on the conscious level, there was no connection between us of which I was aware. <clears throat> Back in New York City in the fall, I was surprised by a telephone call. It was Elizabeth out on Long Island, supported by her giggling girlfriends in the background. And as I listened, she informed me that she would be in the city on Sunday. She asked me if I would spend the day with her. And I agreed with no pause for thought. It was a clear, sunny day in October, as my Columbia football teammates and I had won our game against Brown on Saturday. I was pumped. <laughs> Elizabeth and I met on the steps of the Plaza Hotel at Fifth Avenue and 59th Street. <clears throat> I decided that I was going to treat our meeting as a formal date, and that I was going to share with Elizabeth some of my absolute favorite places in that section of New York City. She came up to me on the steps of the hotel, we said our quiet greetings, and she proceeded to place herself at my side. It was so nice to have a tall, sparklingly attractive young woman next to me, stride by stride. We spoke to each other, I was aware that she was moving with me in a mysterious manner, which somehow communicated the idea that we were a couple. She was completely open to receiving the gifts that I set before her, one by one, picking up quite perceptively <laughs> my pleasure at sharing them with her. We first went to see the 20 foot tall teddy bear <laughs> at FAO Shorts. It's no longer there, unfortunately. Then we sat under the rose window at St. Patrick's Cathedral and bathed in the sunlight and the purple air, which streamed through the window and caused the suspended dust motes to sparkle with iridescent color. The car noises from Fifth Avenue seemed far away. Next we shrugged at the statue of Atlas, and Rand would have been pleased, and watched the ice skaters pirouette at Rockefeller Center. This was followed by us swimming through a green filtered pond in the Monet Room at the MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art, in a basement room whose walls had been painted green and where the glass in the windows were also tilted with green. More than a dozen of Monet's water lilies were displayed and I felt as if I were a fish in the pond at Giverny. After the traditional cup of hot chocolate together with ambrosial, bro, ambrosial whipped cream at Rumpelmeyer's, where I took all my dates, we walked to the subway through a pedestrian tunnel underneath the highway that runs through Central Park. The sun was setting by then, and in the middle of the tunnel where the light was most filtered, without words, Elizabeth and I embraced and kissed. Even Mikhail Baryshnikov could not have more carefully choreographed our movements. We broke our embrace, said not a word to each other, and Elizabeth thanked me for a lovely day when she arrived at the subway. I like to think that her smile may have deepened a bit as she said this, but my eyes may have been deceiving me, as eyes are wont to do. Elizabeth and I never saw each other again, and that is all right too. She is with me in every moment of tenderness that I've been able to spend with any woman in my life. Please accept her, my dears, as she bears gifts, not threats. On my dresser, I have approximately a dozen semi-precious stones. One of them, about an inch and a half in length, is coffee, with cream brown, together with orange marmalade specks. 
one side of the stone is completely smooth and the other side is ridged. When I first pick up the stone, it is cool, but my hand soon warm, warms it. I call this stone Elizabeth. Some 50 years later, I began, after I began calling the stone Elizabeth, I decided to write Elizabeth a letter. Dear Elizabeth, I know your eyes will never see this letter, but I want to send it. I want to write it nevertheless. I see you now as a tall, thin, graceful woman with great teeth. The smile around your lips has deepened and your observations are tinged with both sadness and wisdom. In that order, grandchildren are at your knees just taking in your love and fierce protection of them. Do you ever sit in front of the fire, Elizabeth, and see that day that we spent together in the flames? I do and hope that you do too. We created something together that is as permanent as our lives and perhaps even something that we would pass on to others. Thank you for picking up that phone. Thank you for your boldness. Thank you for offering me your innocence. Thank you for casting a powerful spell upon me. You will always walk by my side. Your spell catcher. Sparky. That's a typical chapter in my book. You can see the part that nostalgia plays in it. As a Russian, I want to share with you, I tend to think sometimes <laughs> in concrete images. So I'm going to share with you my favorite fable called Stone Soup. Now, there are some of you who may claim that Stone Soup is um, Czechoslovakian, Polish. You're all wrong. The legend of Stone Soup is from Bessarabia. And the reason I know this is that my mother taught it to me. It came from her village. Here we go. This old woman lived by herself on the side of the road. And it came time to make lunch and she opened the cupboard and there was nothing in the cupboard except two large stones. This didn't stop her, she said, well, I'll just make stone soup. So she took the stones, put them in the pot and on the stove and set them to boil. She lived by the side of the road and a stranger came through the village, peeked his head in to the window, saw the pot on the stove and he said, what are you making, old mother? And she said, stone soup. He said, I'm a stranger in this town. I've never heard of stone soup before. May I contribute these three carrots that I have in my pocket? And she said, of course you may. So the next traveler came down the road and had some spices. The next traveler had some potatoes. And at the end, they all sat down and ate the stone soup, which nurtured them all. That is such a powerful metaphor for how I see human beings connect with one another through nurturance and through sharing. Now, <laughs> a dear friend of mine <laughs> heard me on many occasions talk about stone soup. So on my 75th birthday, she came to my birthday party and this is what she brought me. It 
it is stone soup. It is a pot, a dish, filled with stones. How thoughtful, how insightful, how special and precious this gift is to me. Thank you, Carly, wherever you are. It, it'll never leave my side. So that's what my book has. <laughs> it's filled with them. <laughs> There's also my role as a teacher. What a rare privilege that is. And I wanted to share with you a poem by Robert Frost <laughs> that uh, brilliantly illustrates my philosophy of teaching. The poem's title is What Fifty Says. When I was young, my teachers were the old. I gave up fire for them till I was cold. I suffered like a metal being cast. I went to school to age to learn the past. Now when I'm old, my teachers are the young. What can't be molded must be cracked and sprung. I strain at lessons fit to start a suture. I go to school, to youth, to learn the future. <laughs> my students teach me more than I can ever teach them. And they're wonderful. And that's why it's so rewarding to me. And that's why I sing on the way to my work or my classes. <clears throat> the best expression <laughs> of my philosophy of teaching is in the work by the memoir by Frank McCourt called Teacher Man. If you haven't read Teacher Man and you want to know the excitement of being creative and teaching, please read Teacher Man by Frank McCourt. While we're doing Bibli bibliography, <laughs> narrative therapy it's called, <laughs> I want to suggest a few books for your consideration. These books are magic markers for me in my journey, and I hope to do them justice. First is Siddhartha by Herman Hesse. I've read that book five times, and each time it teaches me something new that I didn't know before. So, if you're not familiar with Siddhartha, please read it. The next book is by Pat Conroy. It's called The Prince of Tides. Now, I know it was made into a movie with Barbara Streisand. The movie was just designed to market Barbara Streisand. It's 10% of the book, so don't get hung up on the DVD. The Prince of Tides is far and away the best book on childhood psychopathology that has ever been written. Some of the scenes are totally unforgettable. Just one quote. Larceny is not a difficult crime to condone. It is a difficult crime to condone unless your childhood was the item stolen. If your childhood is stolen from you, the best you can ever do is to make the sucker float. <laughs> that says it all. So, 
the second after Siddhartha is the Prince of Tides. The third and last book is B.F. Skinner's Walden II. It's frankly utopian, but <laughs> it is so thoughtful about human beings at so many levels that I just marvel. I've sat in seminars with B.F. Skinner, <laughs> and let me tell you, the man had no sense of humor. <laughs> but he can be excused for that. <clears throat> it's very clear in my mind that I have to sharply differentiate two states of being and I confuse them at my own cost. The first state of being is what I call the macro grasp of the world around me. Social constructionist theory, uh, mass movements, that's the macro. I want to contrast that with the micro. I can't deal with the macro. I can't deal with it. The idea of turning the page in the New Yorker magazine and seeing a child, a picture of a child starving in Africa. I can't handle that. I can't handle it. <clears throat> My friend, very, very close friend, asked me to go to the Holocaust Museum with him. And being his friend, I agreed. Bad mistake. When I got to the cattle car, the real cattle car, and all the walls were covered with the nail files, prints of the people who were jammed into the cattle car. I bolted for the sidewalk. I can't do it. <clears throat> so, knowing my limits, <laughs> duh, I have decided to show my caring at the micro level not the macro level. And my full energy is engaged by the person in front of me. A student of mine wrote me a thank you letter and she said, what I'll carry away the most with me that I've received from you is your soft eyes. Soft eyes? <laughs> and I spoke to another close friend of mine and she said, yes, I know what she means about your soft eyes. There's another component. And I say, what might that be? And she says, the compassion in your voice. So that's, at the micro level, what I share with my clients, my friends, with strangers on the street. <clears throat> and <laughs> central to my way of connecting at the micro level <laughs> is my sense of humor. It's not everybody's sense of humor, trust me. I never laugh at people. Never. I laugh at the human comedy and the absurdity. I could tell you so many stories. I'm walking down the hospital corridor and there's a man 
in the cart are coming toward me and he's got this huge wheeled carriage with toolboxes and machinery and it's awkward. So I say to him, a complete stranger in the hall, my mother told me that unless I used my head, I would have to use my feet. That's a New York comment. He looks at me without pause as he's wheeling the cart down the hall and he says, my mother taught me to use both my feet and my head. <laughs> that was a perfect moment. We laughed at our human interaction. And uh, that's the way I moved through the world. I can't go to the Vietnam Wall without close supportive friends at my side. And I touch the name of John Camp Jr. And I just touch it. And my friends understand. That's what friends are for, to be with you in those moments of time. And it forges bonds between you that are indissolvable because you've shared that experience with each other. It never leaves me. My apartment where I live is a museum. Every item around me on the walls is a talisman. It has deep personal meaning to me. And the talisman evokes the memories of what it represents. Talismans technically are called transitional objects. They're like Linus's blanket. They nurture us. They comfort us. They orient us. And everything here, everything <laughs> has a story. <laughs> Over there, and you can't see it, is an eighth-sized violin. This size. Every male breeze, good until my half-sister Olga was born, every male breeze, upon birth, is given an eighth-sized violin. That's the tradition in the family. My father was a concert violinist, a conductor and composer, child prodigy. And I was given, um, and I still have it. And after Spike, it's probably the next thing I would grab in a fire to make it out the door. It's a talisman. It has enormous personal meaning to me. It connects me to my father and to the heritage. <clears throat> so let me end by defining in my, I think, colorful language what it means for me to be a psychologist. Three criteria. First, I'm a lapidarian reconstructionist. I have a jeweler's loop and I do small suturing transplants and bone repairs to injured parts of human beings who are in front of me. I'm a lapidarian reconstructionist first. Secondly, and I apologize for the vulgarity, I'm a fecal archaeologist, and I don't have to explain what that means. And I work 
in an abattoir, a butcher shop. And I have to be able to handle that. And last but not least, but most important, I'm a wounded healer. I come by that honestly. And the work that I have done over 50 years with post-traumatic stress disorder victims has broken my heart. And I have cardiac symptoms and my diagnosis is secondary PTSD. And if I would decide to do it again, knowing the consequences, I would do it again. Because the rewards are so great. To be able to use my wounds as the source of empathy and affiliation is what makes me live from day to day. So <laughs> I hope this has made some sense to you. It's a rambling, <laughs> to put it mildly, introduction. But if you're at all interested in my song, read my book and let me know what you think. Thank you. Namastasi.